I'm going to introduce myself first. My name is Kanan Mandalia. Uh, I'm, I work at the Harrington location, and um, I'm going to share um, some of uh, my uh, insight on the art and history of henna. And um, let me share my screen with you. I am already sharing my screen with you. I'm sorry. I'm a little nervous and I'm getting a little uh, weird about here, but let's about start. So um, we're going to be talking about the art and history of henna. And uh, starting off uh, straight off the bat, what is henna? Henna is the Persian name of a bushy tree cultivated mainly for its leaves. It's a reddish, uh, dark reddish orange plant dye derived from the shoots and leaves of the Egyptian privet plant, uh, tree, which is also the botanical name is Lawsonia inermis and mostly used for cosmetic and decorative purposes. Um, the leaves are normally uh, dried and crushed into a green powder to which water is added to make a paste. And it is applied to the body and left for usually up to two hours to dye the skin a deep orangish red color. Um, this um, then fades over the course of about two to three weeks. And um, um, it's like also very popular, popularly known as a temporary tattoo for that reason. Um, henna is also used to um, dye hair, just wanting to let that uh, be known. Uh, henna is also known in the world by many other names, like as, as listed, Mandi, Puker, Camphor, uh, Kafir, Tien Kao, uh, also known as a big nonet, big nonet tree, etc. Uh, most, uh, uh, most of the times, the main parts that are used are going to be the leaves, box, and flower. The flowers are used to distill a fragrance and the leaves um, mostly for um, the henna dye. Bark is sometimes used towards some medicinal usage, which we'll talk about later. Um, henna is considered to have antiseptic, astringent, antibacterial, antifungal, antispasmodic, and antipyretic properties. Uh, basically, um, it's a popular, it's been used a lot of the times as a popular treatment for skin disorders in India and North Africa. It's often used to make an instant scab over open wounds. It also soothes uh, burns and eczema. Um, it's, um, it provides relief from bruises, from sprains, as well as rheumatic and arthritic pain. Um, henna applied to the head can also relieve a headache uh, and when applied to the soles of the feet often soothes headaches uh, caused by the heat. Um, it is um, often used as a cure for athlete's foot, corns, foot odor, blisters and minor cuts. Um, and as I said earlier, it's also used as a hair conditioner because many people believe that it prevents hair loss and uh, cures dandruff just a lot of anti things that make a lot of positive things right there. I mean, that's just a silly joke, but going to our next slide. Um, the um, henna has cooling properties. The desert people of Rajasthan, Punjab, and Gujarat in India were the first to stumble upon the cooling properties of the henna plant. Uh, they found that dipping their hands and feet in the paste made out of the crushed henna leaves gave them much relief from the unremitting heat. Um, they also noticed that once the paint was scraped off, as long as the color remained, so did the cooling effect. So they uh, applied this um, paste on their heads also for the same cooling effect. Um, this, was, uh, this is also a practice followed by the Berbers of North Africa. Um, they apply the henna on their heads for, you know, to cool, cool themselves off. Like, as you can see, people can also get very creative. So apart from just putting it all over your foot, uh, people have also used um, any, any canvas as a canvas for henna. Let's put it that way. Um, um, seeing that all you needed to is have that uh, dye um, on your skin, Women began painting sometimes with just one central dot, added smaller dots to make it look more beautiful instead of just having it all one color. And then finding it uh, that since this still had the same cooling effect, they started creating designs. Um, in the past, uh, they used a thin piece of silver, maybe, you know, like twigs, uh, really um, 
uh, thin pieces of wood. Um, there's also like, you know, metal um, kind of needle like uh, uh, instruments that were used sometimes to create the designs in the past. Nowadays we use cones, which are kind of like pastry cones uh, that are filled with henna. If to give you an idea, I mean, like to the uh, henna cones that you could use, and the uh, cones help in making the designs a lot more intricate and fine and um, easier to do. It doesn't take you hours to like kind of dip your instrument in the henna and then apply it. I just wanted to add before we go to the next slide, as henna um, uh, leaves are considered body cooling and astringent. Local folk wisdom normally uh, used to advise against henna hair coloring when sick or when temperatures are colder or if you're pregnant. But it depends on what part of the world you are from and if you believe in that. So just uh, wanting to share that. Going into the history of henna. Um, there is evidence that the Neolithic people in the uh, Katal Hyuk used henna as far back as 7 BC to ornament their hands. The earliest written evidence mentioning henna being specifically used for a bride is inscribed on a tablet dating back to 2100 BC found in Northwest Syria. It has also been very extensively used in Southern China to uh, you know, decorate the, the nails. Nails have been very popular, henna, and uh, that was the old, I guess it was the oldest version of nail polish. Uh, you know, like, and then it lasted quite a bit. You, and you didn't have to worry about it peeling off except that it grew. As your nails grew, the, the stain uh, also moved, so you had to keep restaining your nails. The picture that you see are uh, henna blossoms. The um, ancient murals, uh, talking about the historical hues of henna, ancient murals in the Ajanta Elara caves uh, near Mumbai, you know, like, uh, they're, they're very famous uh, for uh, really well-preserved cave paintings of the time. Uh, they are they're found near Mumbai. They were dated before AD 350 and they show a princess of Pataliputra that was an ancient kingdom um, spanning like kind of, a, I would say um, most central part of India, uh, current India, reclining under a tree, having her hands and feet painted with flowery henna designs. Um, and also the use of henna could be seen in cave paintings found in the island uh, rip, uh, island country of Sri Lanka. And this was literally seven centuries before the Mughal invasion, before, you know, the Mughals brought in their version of henna. So henna was like uh, very much uh, all over the um, Indian subcontinent and, you know, in China and uh, Middle East and, uh, you know, like over quite a few of these. Oh, oh God, I lost my word, uh, continents. Um, I did want to uh, also mention that archeological research indicates that henna was used in ancient Egypt to stain the fingers and toes of pharaohs prior to mummification. Um, and in um, the, if you, the, the word for henna in hieroglyphics was uh, puker. This is uh, this uh, is the depiction for Cleopatra. I just wanted to put that here. Uh, basically, just some fun facts. The flower scent known as camphire, which is made from uh, henna plant blossoms, it was presumed to be the source of Cleopatra's perfume, cyprinum. And it has been, uh, legend has it that uh, cyprinum is what she dipped the sails of her barge in on her way to meet Mark Anthony. Um, also, did want to add the Egyptian government has uh, replanted henna shrubs. Uh, that's also known as the Egyptian privet in the um, gardens of the Temple of Amun at Karnak to symbolize henna's historic uses by Ramses I of the 19th century in 1320 BC. Um, I just wanted to ask um, any questions. Um, are we good? We good? Okay. Talking about the art of Mehendi. Uh, Mehendi is another word very popularly used in the Indian subcontinent or Southeast Asia, uh, known because it's the word in Hindi and Urdu. Uh, and uh, also, 
um, if we use the word henna, it's pronounced as hina. It's not more like henna, it's more like hina or mehendi. It's practiced in Pakistan, India, Africa, and the Middle East since ancient times, especially for um, special occasions like birthdays, festivals, weddings, um, etc. In Turkey, on the henna night, during the celebrations, the bride's right hand is decorated with henna during which silver and gold coins are pushed into the palm of her hand with uh, the wish that it would always remain active. Uh, in Afghanistan, um, henna is uh, said to bring good luck and happiness. So, um, um, you know, like um, henna and uh, I guess good luck and happiness goes hands in hand. Mehndi night is where the bride, family and brides get to, uh, sorry, bride, family, and friends get together to celebrate the upcoming wedding. It is customary for the bridegroom to supply the bride and other female members of the family with henna. And uh, it much is made of its arrival. Like it's, it's uh, when the henna is, it, it's normally done um, a couple of days before the actual uh, wedding. And usually the mothers of the bride and the groom dab a little henna into the palms of their soon to be married son or daughter. And uh, before the serious business of designing begins and, you know, like you have henna artists who will come in and um, design, uh, put in the designs for the, it's called bridal mandi. And, uh, and like they, they would also kind of have a henna night or a henna party where uh, the female members of the family will get together and uh, get henna put on their hands. And uh, this follows, this is a perfect opportunity for them of uh, female members of both families to get to know each other as they take their time applying henna amidst a lot of um, teasing and storytelling. Uh, folk wisdom says that henna strengthens the bond of relationships between generations. Applying henna designs involves touch. And most often this close contact is given by the henna artist to the recipient and is, based, uh, is mostly from one woman to another. And uh, as I said, like it, it's normally started off with the mother-in-law or the mother of the bride applying, starting off with a little application. It could be a dot. Uh, sometimes I tell you, don't do more than a dot because you'll spoil the design. You know, like, I mean, everybody has, everybody's a critic. So we'll go there. So our um, next slide, we're going to be talking about popular traditions and some fun stuff. The most popular tale about Mehendi uh, traditions claims that the bride-to-be will not have to touch any housework as long as the henna designs last. So uh, basically, in fact, in the olden days, during the first month of marriage, a maid would take care of all the household duties, including bathing. So the new bride would not need to use her hands at all and, you know, like keep the stain for longer. Uh, this allowed her plenty of free time to get to know the members of her new family. And, you know, like, as, as, as we said, like, you know, if you still have, uh, it's a very popular saying, you don't, you don't make the bride work with henna stains on her hand. That's like, you know, you're, you're not a good mother-in-law or, you know, not a good family. Yeah, you, you need to let her have her time. Uh, another stain, uh, another story is about the henna stain. Um, the thing is, uh, the darker the henna stain on the skin, the more the groom's mother will love her new daughter-in-law. Uh, because the bride goes to live with her husband's family immediately after the wedding. This is an important consideration. The story is not as far-fetched as you imagine if you consider that originally henna designs were painstakingly applied with a fine toothpick-like stick or twig. And uh, the process could take as long as 24 hours and require considerable patience from the bride. It follows that the most patient of brides will receive the most intricate decorations and the very deepest stains, proving that, the, that she was naturally endowed with the gift of patience or was willing to learn patience. Either way, it was considered to be a good indication of how she would get along with others. Um, another popular custom is to hide the initials of the husband in the Mehendi design. On the wedding night, the bride asks a new husband to find the initials. If he's successful, it means he will be the dominant partner in the marriage. But if he fails, the wife will be the one to rule in the relationship. Um, naturally, as you can guess, the men, the artists go to great lengths to conceal the initials and the intricate designs. In fact, they have fun 
in between this fight <laughs> between the groom and the bride. And uh, in fact, uh, nowadays, uh, young brides have become very, very creative about where they want to be hiding the initials. It's no longer the uh, the traditional places like in your the palms of your hand or on the back of your um, uh, hands, and uh, it could be anywhere on the body. And you know, uh, in fact, just because it's 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 like a temporary dye, uh, they can write it anywhere in initials. You can just imagine the fun, and also, I mean, I, I guess it's building a relationship from hunting an initial. So um, going to our next slide. Um, uh, before we go to our next slide, I, I mean, if anybody has uh, uh, anything um, similar to share from their uh, uh, culture, if you are, you know, um, if you use henna or you have some acquaintance with it or you've heard some other story, please feel free to share with it, share that with us in the chat. It would be great to know. Um, talking about our next slide, henna styles from around the world. So we're going to start off with African henna designs. Um, as you can see from the picture, henna uh, African henna patterns are usually very simple, bold, large geometric shapes and designs with abstract symbols. Um, geometric figures such as triangles, crosses, squares, eight-pointed stars, circles and spirals are widely used. Uh, basic shapes change meaning when drawn together. One triangle symbolizes an eye, but five together show a hand. Um, square is shown, seen to have healing powers and squares joined together symbolize protection. Um, that was the basic meaning between you know, some of the shapes in there. Um, popular symbol of the Berbers of uh, some more examples of African designs. Um, I just wanted to share a popular symbol of the Berbers of North Africa is a cross in the center of two diamonds. A diamond, also known as a timrit, deflects away the evil eye and the one inside the other called tit, with the cross at its center is believed to direct the energy away in four directions. Um, the Berbers believe that the main purpose of the henna patterns is to protect the wearer from uh, evil spirits. Uh, also wanted to share with you that in Morocco, women use permanent tattoos to mark significant occasions of their lives. And henna is painted over the top to darken and heal these markings to make it even stand out more. So um, just a fun, fun fact. As you can see, uh, the bold graphic style of North African henna patterns um, could be applied on the arm as well. It makes for very good cuffs or, you know, like, I mean, um, uh, lately henna has been very popular uh, amongst everyone. It's no longer been, it's no longer just the women um, that are adorning themselves with henna. Uh, it's been uh, very popular, especially as a temp temporary tattoo. Uh, and um, men especially like the bold African henna styles because they, they really... Um, um, they're not flowery, they're, they're more chunky, and I guess they like them more. Um, next slide, we're going to be talking about the Arabic henna designs. Um, typically floral in design, um, the patterns make good use of henna's light and dark tones. Uh, judicious use of uh, the, the designs that are used, uh, the smears and the thickness of you know the henna designs help in achieving the effect as you notice these lines are much more thicker so when they the thicker the henna the deeper the stain and um, they use um, uh, you know like uh, some tooth like toothpick kind of uh, uh, instruments or q-tips to kind of um, create that shade and uh, dark and light effect and um, this is an example of a Middle Eastern woman uh, with uh, Arabic henna. Um, most of the flesh is deliberately left exposed to heighten the effect. And sometimes the um, finger and toe tips are also filled in completely. Um, just a, a fact to share uh, in Islam, prayers are made with arms open wide and palms facing skyward. So as not to distract from prayer, the hands can be decorated with abstract designs such as floral motive, motifs, 
but more conspicuous drawings like birds or faces are not permitted are not allowed. So that's why um, most of the henna is very floral and uh, in, in, uh, in design or, or they'll be abstract, but there will be no faces in, in it at all. Going to the Indian henna style. Indian style henna is very intricate and detailed and it makes use of symbols like common ones, uh, the peacocks, which symbolize love, Wines symbolizing devotion, flowers, a new life, fruits, immortality, etc. Um, symbolism is very important in Indian culture, and Mehndi is one of the languages used to express it. Uh, Paisley designs also um, kind of uh, one of the bases for the uh, peacocks. You know, it's always the peacocks always have some part of it is Paisley. Uh, uh, Paisley designs are the, amongst the most popular with a lot of intricate filling work. All symbols start with a seed uh, called the peach from which everything grows. There are simple forms such as a line, rekha, and an angle, kona, where the two straight lines join to reflect the duality of life. Um, triangle pointing upwards represents fire and the ascent to heaven, or when pointing downwards, a symbol of water or grace, or grace descending from the heavens. Um, the circle denotes wholeness, the round of existence in this phenomenal world. Uh, the mandala is a symbol of uh, enlightenment, usually in the shape of a circle with squares, triangles, and circles in it, within it. Um, the lotus denotes purity that grows in muddy water. Fla as I said, flowers portray new life and childhood. Um, fruits uh, show um, talk about... Um, Immortality, both the rose and the unripe mango are very common in uh, bridal designs. Uh, they're known as the unripe mango or uh, kacha aam uh, in Hindi. And um, while uh, popularly known, the shape is popularly known as a paisley shape. So just to give you some context there, the wine uh, is a symbol of devotion. The most common design is a peacock because it's seen as a symbol of love and desire because traditionally peacocks come out during the rains and rains are also are normally seen as a time of passion. Uh, parrots are uh, seen as messengers and swans denoting success are also very popular. Um, there are sometimes the designs have small dots in them. These represent falling rain. Again, rain, the theme being the symbolizing love and waves denote passion and longing. Just to share something with you. Here's an example of bridal henna. A bridal henna can get very intricate and Indian mehndi involves very thin lines for lacy floral paisley patterns with lines and dots, dense patterns, uh, fillers co covering entire hands, forearms, feet and chins. And um, in this example, if, if you've seen like there is a bride and a groom that's also drawn in their arms, uh, in the palm of the hands and uh, everything the sky's the limit. But uh, yes, there will always be a paisley thrown in, there'll be a peacock somewhere um, and a whole bunch of lines. Just to share it. Here, talking about global henna styles. Um, today, uh, you will notice um, people all over the world are getting henna applied on their bellies during pregnancies. Um, it's, you know, henna parties uh, where, uh, you know, this the, the, the mother-to-be gets uh, henna put on her belly, uh, becoming very popular. Uh, they're also very uh, popular with, uh, with um, people undergoing chemotherapy uh, because, you know, it's, it's a very wonderful way to kind of, um, uplift your spirits when you know you're faced with the loss of hair and uh, the designs can get really intricate as you can see in some of these um, it's also kind of uh, since the late 80s it's kind of uh, become very popular in the in the media uh, madonna being one very good example of it gwen stefani was another one that has uh, gone on stage in saris with um, with uh, henna on her uh, palms during her concerts and popularized um, uh, henna a lot. And here are some more examples of like heads covered with uh, henna with or women with 
um, henna during on their bellies during pregnancy. Um, uh, we have. Do we have any comments? Any questions? Um, I did, uh, like as I've mentioned before, uh, henna is, um, uh, in fact, a lot of people know henna as a temporary tattoo. Um, and uh, the reason being, as like uh, shared before, this is a temporary plant-based dye and it, it, it stays on your skin for about um, two to three weeks, depending on how uh, deeply and how often you wash that area, your, you know, like with soap and water. The more soap and water, the fainter it gets, and it could potentially fade away much earlier than that. Um, some people uh, have resorted to using henna uh, to try out the tattoo that they did want to get done permanently to see how it would look and if that's what they were going to go for before they actually go in and make the move to get it permanently inked. Uh, uh, henna has become uh, super popular uh, as um, just just one of like uh, uh, like a design to have like you know you do your nails you put nail polish on and to to feel good and like sometimes like let me get a temporary tattoo and used um, henna for that um, so this is what we see nowadays now we're going to go into what is henna paste made of um, real natural henna is a mixture of the following. Uh, when I'm talking henna paste is a mixture of the following. Natural henna. When we're talking about natural henna, one should look for a bright green, finely ground henna powder. The brighter the powder, the deeper the stain. Natural henna smells just like a herb, leafy. If it smells unpleasant or of chemicals, then it is not natural henna. Um, the second thing that you need is just plain old water. Uh, some lemon juice to, you know, for the um, acidic content and about five to 10 drops of essential oils. Um, traditionally, it's eucalyptus oil that has been the most popular, but it's basically any kind of essential oils, most popular ones being eucalyptus oil, clove oil, or lavender oil. Um, and, uh, you know, just to, and then all of this is mixed together and um, uh, to make that paste. I did want to add that sometimes, uh, like, you know, people have their, people swear by different things to um, get the, you know, everybody's aim is to get a deeper stain. So uh, people get very inventive. So sometimes uh, tamarind paste is added. Sometimes, uh, you know, like uh, coffee or tea, tea leaves are boiled in, in, uh, in this water. And uh, after this, it's been strained, you know, like it's really boiled for a long time. So that, like you get a really dark brown tea color or coffee color, and then it is strained out. And that water is what is used to uh, mix in the henna. Uh, oftentimes henna is mixed and left in an iron container. So to rest for a bit. So like, you know, like when there is a reaction with the um, iron, uh, it creates ferric, ferrous oxide and that kind of gives a reddish color tint more of a reddish color tint. So uh, people try all sorts of uh, different things. And even if you don't do it, if you just use these five things, you're still going to get a reddish tint to your henna dye. And you normally kind of soak it and keep it for about a couple of hours to five, uh, three, four, you know, like five hours is good enough. You know, you could kind of soak it at night and then it's ready to go in the morning. Uh, whatever helps, but as little as a couple of hours is good enough. Um, the other things that we um, kind of keep ready is uh, make ourselves a lemon and sugar fixer. So a lemon and sugar fixer is basically like, as, as you know, like um, uh, when you put the henna on and especially with the cone nowadays, the lines are much more thinner and intricate. They're very delicate lines sometimes. And, uh, it's basically a paste which will dry super fast uh, and it flakes off. So if you want the deep, if you want that stain to be deeper, you need to keep it on your skin a lot longer than um, at least an hour. 
So uh, if you make yourself a mixture of uh, sugar and lemon, that is uh, just soak the sugar with enough lemon to kind of have them dissolve. And that would make a sticky paste kind of thing. You would use um, cotton wool to uh, dab that mixture onto the um, um, henna paste that is drying on your uh, hands and uh, so that it wets it again and it leaves it on for longer and uh, it doesn't flake off that super quickly. So, so you need the lemon and sugar fixer. The, basically the citric acid in the lemon helps henna soak into the skin and deepen the color while the sugar helps the design to stick and prevents the henna paste from flaking off. So um, this is the um, next best thing. I would say tablespoon. Okay. It's like uh, I would uh, I would put a juice of one lemon, roughly speaking. Um, that's more than enough. I don't need to. Depending, of course, if you're uh, soaking, I guess henna for putting it on at least ten to fifteen palms, you'd maybe add two lemons. But you don't need a lot of lemon. About a tablespoon to one lemon is good. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Lastly, when you're purchasing henna, be very careful when buying ready-made henna paste for use. Natural henna will always stain orange to reddish dark brown. There is no other colored henna. If it is other colors, it's not henna. Uh, and if the paste claims to have a black stain, again, that's not natural. Um, this could be black henna, uh, which contains uh, this uh, paraf. I cannot pronounce that whole word, so I'm just going to let you read it. Paraphenyl, dimine, etc. Chemicals that could not uh, that that sometimes on it 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 may not react on your skin, but it may cause rashes for others. So with everything, if you're not sure, always do a patch test. You know, apply it in the uh, apply it one little dot on the inside of your elbow, leave it on for some time. If it doesn't react, you're good to go, if you're not sure. But for the most part, as was mentioned earlier, when you smell henna, it should smell like dried leaf. It's, it's, it shouldn't smell uh, obnoxious or something like that because that's not henna. So um, sometimes uh, like uh, people put in um, powdered lime, well, when we say powdered lime, I'm talking kind of like limestone. So to get that, because I believe that would make it uh, darker, but mostly it's powdered crystal ammoniac or this particular chemical. So just wanting to share that. We are going to take a look at, I've got some uh, samples of what I was talking about. So we'll, we'll move to that. Just give me one moment on that. Sorry, technical assistance required right now. Okay, so sharing with you, this is an example of um, henna powder. 
Uh, if you go to any in Indian or Indo-Pak stores or even Mediterranean stores, you will find packets of uh, henna normally always has, uh, it would specifically, if it, if it mentions hair anywhere on it, that's not the packet you want because that contains added chemicals or may have other stuff for your hair in there, which is not what you need to create the paste for henna. Uh, most of the henna that you would buy has a picture of a bride uh, in the middle with, uh, you know, like with other other friends around, and it would just basically say um, henna or Rajasthani henna or something like that. So just to give you one example, this is eucalyptus oil. Uh, I did not share this with you earlier, but these are known as jacket bottles, and uh, they're also popular with uh, quite a few people uh, that find it easier to use this. They fill, fill the bottle with the henna stain and use it with these tips to create the thin designs. Uh, it's a matter of preference, but um, just wanted to share that. Uh, some of the uh, stuff that you might need to kind of help you while you're uh, doing, uh, always have your handy dandy Q-tip, uh, some cotton wool, toothpicks, you know, like when sometimes you are uh, you are squeezing a tube um, where which you which you're trying to get the henna out of. Sometimes uh, the trick to uh, using the cone is uh, getting the right amount of pressure to have it have the henna paste come out steadily, so you can come up with more intricate designs. Having said that, things happen. Sometimes you end up um, squeezing out too much of a blob. Uh, you could use a Q-tip to either take out the whole blob itself, or you could use a toothpick to kind of thin out the ex excess. So basically you need to have some of that around. Um, this bottle basically was supposed to contain, I mean, it, you can't see it right now, but it's got a mixture of uh, sugar and um, the lemon juice that is to dab on. And uh, this is one example of a very co popular, common, um, ready-made uh, cone that you can get in most of the uh, Asian stores. Uh, and you would normally find it near the counter. And But I would, um, I would still say that it should smell like a paste, like a herbal paste to you. If it doesn't smell right, follow the patch test. Uh, most, uh, there are uh, some which will specifically say black henna, and that's up to you to try that out, but just wanted to say that. Um, this is one more example, and uh, this is basically, it's, it's, it's a cone made out of, uh, you know, like uh, plastic, and you just uh, fill it with the, cone, with the henna paste in there. Uh, you snip off the end uh, to uh, just, um, you snip off the end to, have it as thin to, or as uh, thick uh, a line that you want to draw. So you, you be very careful when you're snipping off the end, because if you snip off too much, you will end up having the paste really rush out. And uh, practice, practice your pressing on that first and see if you can draw a couple of lines with that first, because that would be the first part if you were not familiar to using henna. Uh, one of the things that I found very useful and like, you know, if people want to learn how to do henna, I have found is uh, you could make, you know, draw yourself an uh, outline of your hand, palm or something, and then use that uh, um, stencil to kind of practice on, on a piece of paper before you actually put it on someone's skin. Because uh, henna, though, it's uh, uh, it takes some time to dip, deepen the color. It's very easy to get an uh, orange stain immediately. So if you're practicing on someone's hand you, and you don't want to leave a blob on there, it's better to practice on, on a piece of paper or something first before you actually do that. One of the other things, as I said, like a lot of henna has um, intricate fillings in it. Uh, it's a good idea to use um, for your practice purposes, use something like that to kind of uh, try out um, a filling on a piece of paper. So like if you can follow the design and you're managing to get the, like as, you know, the design in, that would, uh, you know, like you're, you're good to go. So just to practice that. So like, I mean, I, I, you can, you can, there are a whole bunch of different fillers. One of the most popular fillers is like, you know, like we talked about um, everything starting from a dot, which is a beach. And then, you know, like covering it with a circle. 
you could uh it's 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 whatever design you want to make out of it you could decide to make a flower out of this make a sun out of it have leaves at the end you know like you could do petals like so or you could choose to uh, you know like have lines and then just have leaves so it's 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 uh, you could follow traditional designs you could make your own designs uh, but uh, you know it's whatever you make of it uh, another uh, popular thing is of course uh, you a lot of henna is also put on the fingertips so you could also try to put an outline of your nail of your finger and then just practice on that so it's always good to have that um, I did want to, uh, before we go off, I wanted to share one of my favorite uh, designs with you. I love paisleys. Uh, and uh, I think the one of the easiest ways I can describe it is you start off with an inverted S or a mirror image S. So you could just, sorry. You could just draw an S. And the, uh, to finish the paisley, you would just join the two ends together. You want to transform this into a peacock, or I want to give it uh, it's 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 wherever you want to go with it. And uh, then you you would spend uh, you would try to fill up this entire uh, area with fillers. So whatever um, filler is your interest, you would just kind of you would just continue doing that to until you fill up the whole area. And that that would that would give it really good design uh, when when it dries out and all. It will look very beautiful together. One of the other very popular designs um, that you would find in, in Indian henna is a, is a leaf, uh, which is also filled in the same way. So you would kind of, you could be as fluid as you want, depending on what you want to draw. So So just wanted to share that. Anybody have any questions or want to talk about anything? Share some experiences. I hope everybody um, had a good time uh, and uh, learned something new about Hannah. And uh, it was good to have you with us.